we are honored and grateful for David Rosenberg to be joining us today. Um, he needs no introduction for professional investors because he's had one of the most accomplished careers on Wall Street in the competitive field of economists and strategists. I'm working for Merrill Lynch for nearly two decades, then Gluskin Chef for another one, and then launched his own shop uh, a few years ago. Um, he's collected many of the top honors um, among the polling services. And while polling is a currency on Wall Street, um, influence is much more important. And David's career has impacted the decision-making of many of the world's most respected investors because he makes clear predictions backed up by unique interpretations of data. David's had a clear call on the markets and the economy. And today we'll have the opportunity to dive into his reasoning. Set expectations, we plan to probe some or all of the following topics, depending on time. Inflation, which has been a cornerstone of David's work recently. Will recession, will we have a recession? What will it look like? Asset bubbles, how will they be resolved? Sentiment indicators, are there any good ones and how important are they? It does seem to be the core and consistent thesis among stock market bulls. Retail versus institutional. Retail's grabbed the spotlight over the past few years and passive investing and indexing are significant trends over the last several decades. Has this change fundamentally changed the composition of, this, of, of, um, of investing? Um, then we'd love to get into some of David's predictions, which I'm sure he, in, in different financial assets, uh, and, um, and you did a, in particular, you did a great piece on duration risk this week, and uh, we'll probably talk about that. And then finally, are the forces of the three Ds still exerting disinflationary pressures, uh, debt, demographics, and disruption from technology? Audience, if you have questions, send them our way and we'll address them towards the end of the session. And with that, David, thank you so much for joining and take it away. Well, uh, thanks very much for inviting me on. Uh, uh, are we, if we're gonna go through uh, uh, that particular list, uh, question back to you is you want me to start off with uh, which one, with the Probably, asset? Probably. You know, I think um, when it, you give the overview of your thinking right now and, okay. and, you know, what it's been, how it's evolved, what it is, and then and then you can touch on the subjects as you feel they're important. Well, look, I'll just, well, okay. I mean, there's, there's lots there to, to go through. Uh, you know, when I'm asked uh, who my favorite economist was of all time, it was actually uh, a physicist and uh, I think the youngest uh, Nobel laureate of all time, uh, which was none other than Albert Einstein, uh, who famously said uh, that the power of interest rates is the eighth wonder of the world. <clears throat> so I think that uh, what we have to always talk about at any moment in time, wherever we are in the cycle, uh, whether it's the market cycle uh, or the business cycle, is uh, what's happened with, uh, with interest rates. And anybody who is in the marketplace uh, understands uh, the importance of discounted cash flows, uh, interest rates are extremely powerful. So we have to understand uh, where we are, where we've been, where we're going. So uh, we have been in a new interest rate cycle uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, the markets, of course, uh, had already begun to sense that. Uh, and we have embarked on the most uh, really aggressive uh, tightening cycle by the Fed uh, since the Volcker era of the early 1980s. So the bottom line here is that uh, we are in a pernicious interest rate cycle. Uh, I get a sense we're getting towards the tail end of it. Uh, and the importance here from a macro and a market perspective uh, are the policy lags. Uh, the Fed is talking more about the policy lags, uh, but they continue to raise interest rates uh, into an inverted yield curve. Uh, and I'm not even convinced that although they say publicly that they're still concerned about inflation, even though it's evident, you know, even to the most visually challenged that the pressures on inflation uh, are actually subsiding and subsiding significantly. Uh, I know people are looking for more signs of that out of the labor market, but the labor market in a cycle is always the last man standing. Uh, the pressures on inflation are going down. Uh, my sense from a Fed perspective, and this is what we will see when the FOMC transcripts come out from the latest round of meetings five years from now, 
is that Powell is really taking the punch bowl away. Uh, Powell wants to not create total separation, but he wants to break this very unhealthy link that we've had between the financial economy and the real economy for the past several decades. Uh, at the impairment, by the way, to productivity because we are focusing too much uh, on wealth creation coming out of two asset classes, uh, equities uh, and housing. And this is the Jay Powell. This is uh, Jay Powell veered course, of course, under the weight of the Trump tweets in 2019. Uh, he now has political cover uh, with Joe Biden, who wants this inflation killed. But I would say that the Fed knows what's going on and they have another agenda, which was the agenda that they started when Powell took over in early 2018 when he became Fed chairman. And he said at, the, at that point, we're taking the funds rate above neutral. Of course, it got aborted uh, in 2019. Um, but if you go back to the writings and readings and uh, anything verbal from Jay Powell, <clears throat> he was always in line with people like Richard Fisher uh, and uh, Jeremy Stein uh, and Quarles, always basically talking about the risks of zero rates for too long and extended quantitative easings on extensive financial market risk-taking uh, and imbalances and bubbles. Uh, and so you could say, well, then what was he doing in 2020, 2021? And that's just at this point, crying over spilt milk. The Fed stayed too easy for too long. It's not the first time the Fed has stayed easy for too long. And then on the other side of the mountain, we all pay the price if we're still long risk. And, and so that's what we're back to. We're back to basically humanity. Uh, the Fed is not made up of robots. The Fed is made up of people. Uh, we have uh, business cycles and market cycles, and quite often uh, the Fed exacerbates uh, the magnitude of these cycles because it overstays the accommodation when it's easing policy, and then it overstays uh, the tightening, uh, which of course it's doing right now. So uh, the bottom line here is that uh, this year uh, we had uh, market interest rates uh, going up dramatically. Uh, that was principally because of the Fed. It was very interesting to me uh, that even with the tightening in the labor market and the wages, especially in the unskilled parts of the job market, uh, the commodities, uh, the supply chain issues, uh, that any measure of inflation expectations, whether in the surveys or actually in the tips market, remained uh, remarkably uh, well-contained. Maybe the Fed can pat itself on the back uh, from that. Uh, this was really about real interest rates going up, byproduct of the Fed tightening financial conditions. And that was really behind this year's bear market uh, inequities, was real interest rates being driven by Fed policy that compressed the price earnings multiple. We haven't fully mean reverted yet, by the way. People say, well, we've gone from a 21 multiple down to 16 and change. We're down to the close to the long run average, but mean reversion doesn't mean you stop at the mean. The mean is just a horizontal line through time. Uh, you know, it's not a resting spot. And when you go from excessive valuations uh, at the highs, which we did, it was the highest valuations in the stock market. Um, well, second highest on record outside of the dot-com bubble back in 1999 and 2000. Uh, usually at true market lows, uh, the stock market gets stupid cheap. We're not there yet with a 16 multiple. Maybe we'll get there more with a 12 or 13 multiple, which is a classic recession trough multiple. So we're not there yet. But the argument I'm making is not so much about what interest rates are going to continue to do to the market multiple. It's really what the lagged impact of this interest rate cycle is going to do to the economy and is going to do to corporate earnings. And that's going to be next year's story. So like I said, it all comes down to interest rates. Interest rates work in both directions. Uh, there's never been a Fed easing cycle uh, that failed to precipitate the end of a recession in a bear market. Uh, sometimes the Fed has to push extra hard. They had to do that in 2002, even after the recession ended. Uh, they obviously pushed very hard in the early months of 2009. It ultimately worked. Uh, took a lot of pushing, but it worked. Don't bet against the Fed. Uh, but it works in both directions. And so... Uh, the Fed has raised rates dramatically. We haven't seen all the policy lags hit the economy just yet. That'll be next year's story. Uh, and just remember that. Remember uh, all the lags that happened. I mean, the Fed finishes tightening policy 
in 1989, look what happened in 1990, 91. Not a pretty picture. All that stuff happened after the Fed actually pressed the pause button. The lagged impact of this powerful effect from rising interest rates. Uh, you go back to what happened, uh, you know, in, in 2001, 2002, not a pretty picture. Uh, but all the byproduct of the Fed's aggressive tightening coming out of the Asian crisis in 1999 and 2000. Of course, uh, what did the Fed do? Because of the Asian crisis, long-term capital, they overeased, and then they had to over-tighten. And then with a the lag, we all paid the price. Uh, and then, of course, we had the same thing happen. Uh, Fed's last rate hike was 2006. Uh, going into 07, 08, 09, not a pretty picture. All this stuff happens with the policy lags into the future. The, the thing that I'm finding is that the investors have shortened their time horizons uh, can't see past the tip of their nose. It is very frustrating for those of us that do like to focus on the big picture. I find most people today, it's like long-term is, is like lunch on uh, next Wednesday. That's long-term. Um, but looking ahead to 2023, it's, uh, you know, it's the Chinese uh, year of the rabbit. Uh, and I think that what is going to pop out of the hole uh, is the realization that even as the Fed pauses, and they will at some point. I mean, they're not finished raising rates yet in the face of an averted yield curve, which is really rather interesting. Last central bank to raise rates into an averted yield curve, again, was Paul Volcker. Uh, but then again, that is who Jay Powell continues to compare himself to, is to Paul Volcker. And we know that Paul Volcker killed inflation um, in the early 80s with back-to-back -back recessions. And the one thing we know about the Fed is that you could argue they can't control the supply curve but they sure can control the demand curve. Uh, I said earlier that I'm not so sure this is all about inflation. Uh, I think this is more about uh, a goal in Powell's second term uh, to break this long-term link between the financial economy and the real economy, between Main Street and Wall Street. And so I think this is all about taking the punch bowl away. Uh, and I think that when you argue about, uh, you know, can the Fed, I mean, I might go back and retract what I said before, can the Fed actually affect the supply curve? Well, in some ways, you know, they can. Uh, I think that one of the things that got the Fed really uptight was when you started hearing, I mean, it's one thing to talk about FOMO, fear of missing out, or Tina, there is no alternative, you know, or that the Fed always has your back. I mean, we know this year the Fed's had your back all right, but it's had a knife in your back and it's been twisting it. Um, but when you think about how you must feel as a central banker when you start hearing about themes coming out of Wall Street research houses and it's showing up in the monthly labor market data, uh, which is that the great resignation theme. And all of a sudden, people at young ages, like in their 50s, believing that the Fed has helped me build this incredible nest egg and look out at my 401ks and I don't have to work anymore. I can retire and live off of this. And I think what was frustrating from the Fed was the fact that we didn't get, even with uh, the COVID, I mean, it's still with us, but uh, all the fears behind us, the economy reopening. And the one thing that really lagged in the economy was the labor force participation rate. Why? Uh, even after uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, women were coming back in the labor market, that they were taking their kids back to child care, that we got past the Omicron fears at the beginning of the year. Uh, a lot of people were not coming back in the labor market specifically because they thought they could retire early because the Fed gave me this big, fat golden goose. In the meantime, you're the Fed and you want participation rate to go up. You want that to be part and parcel of your plan to have wages go up, but at a pace that is consistent with low inflation, not high inflation. That's not what they got. They got a labor market that was being undermined by this mentality that I can retire early because of my stock market portfolio. So you see what I'm saying? You know, the Fed is telling you a whole bunch of stuff. It's not about inflation. I mean, they're not, they're not stupid. Uh, it's really about the mentality of that the stock market, crypto, meme stocks, all this stuff is a get rich scheme. You know, I grew up in the era of the 1980s where you looked at the stock, the stock market was not a vehicle to get rich. I guess that stopped in 1987 uh, with Wall Street. 
uh, and, um, you know, and Gordon Gecko, uh, although we know how things ended up for him. Uh, but it used to be that the stock market, you know, was a vehicle for corporate financing for capital investment to either issue debt or issued equity. It wasn't a get rich scheme. It was a scheme for companies to issue equity uh, to spend on capital investment for future productivity growth. Where did we go wrong? All companies have done was buy back their stock because they knew that these central banks were always going to propel the stock market higher. So you see what I'm saying here is that Jay Powell has embarked on a policy which is get back to work. Uh, so there is some supply side elements here. And what he's doing, and he's got the full support of the entire FOMC, I have never seen a central bank chairman, chairperson, have this much support in the face of what's been an incredibly aggressive monetary policy stance. Volcker never had this much support. And so I think that the way we want to look at this is a complete repudi repudiation of the Greenspan, Bernanke, Yellen doctrine of the Fed intervening, keeping interest rates below their natural level as a method of generating positive wealth effects on the economy. That's really what Powell in the second term wants to be known that he was actually the guy that broke the back of mm -hmm. asset bubbles and boom bust cycles once and for all David, it's not I think really that's so much so about inflation inflation was really about uh Paul David, I think that's so important because mm -hmm. the, the narrative is that they were in a bull mar a bear market but that we came just out of a normal market. We forget that in 2021, the market went up 30% for no reason other than massive liquidity and, and those animal spirits that you were talking about. We, we haven't been in a normal market for decades. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For decades. I mean, I mean, what was normal? I mean, I would say that um I would say much of the 1990s made sense to me. Uh then again in the 1990s, you know, the um, you know, Netscape went public in uh, 1995 and ushered in this wonderful, you know, uh, I mean, the internet was already around. <clears throat> um, the, the internet was certainly around uh, in uh, at the Pentagon, uh, <laughs> but it became, but it became, you know, the World Wide Web. It became broadly used globally, major productivity generator. I mean, this is basically about the same as uh, creating electricity in the early 20th century. It was a, a game changer, a one in century game changer for productivity and wealth creation. Um, but then, you know, everything since, uh, and I would say that um, that you can argue that Greenspan was too slow to raise interest rates then too. Um, I mean, he got the product productivity story right. But you see, productivity is great for disinflation, but it also should lead to higher real interest rates. But, you know, Greenspan let her rip. Uh, and then we just continue to have these policies aimed at uh, with, with, with both eyes, just basically on uh, the stock market. Uh, and of course, everything priced off the stock market, which, you know, uh, corporate credit, uh, anything with uh, risk attached to it. Uh, this time around, you know, uh, add crypto um, to the list. So your point is well taken. It's, and I think that this is really what, um, what uh, Powell is, is, is attempting to do. They can't come out and say, I want to take the stock market lower. They can't come out and tell Americans, oh, we want the value of our house to go lower. So you have people like, uh, they, they come out and they say, no, we, we're still concerned about inflation. And inflation is a lagging indicator, but uh, they can get away with that. I mean, they know it's a lagging indicator. That's really not what's on their mind. Yeah. Um, but they can use that as cover. It's really and about, it's really about classic William McChesney Martin circa October 1955, when he famously said, I'm taking the punch bowl away. Now you see when McChesney Martin said that famous quote, by the way, I, I give him speeches all the time now. It's wonderful to be doing that in person. I know that, you know, we're not doing this in person right now. Um, I, I am finding out, by the way, that um, when I'm standing in front of a crowd, um, they, they, they think I'm nervous, but I have to tell them at the beginning that I'm only nervous because after putting on these trousers for the first time in three years, I'm, I'm scared that I'm going to pop the button if I exhale. Uh, but um, I think that that is, uh, 
you know th that is um you know th that i think is 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 the is the real key here uh is that the fed wants to get back to some semblance of normality in the relationship between the real economy and the financial economy we had actually people don't know when i go in front of these crowds and i mentioned mcchesney martin th they don't know who i'm talking about thankfully they they know who paul volcker is uh, McChesney Martin, who was for decades the Fed chairman and, and um, very well regarded, made that famous quote in 1955 that the Fed is taking the punch bowl away. Guess what? And you had, you had, you know, pretty well the conditions for a bear market for the next three years. And we had two recessions separated three years apart. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I quoted uh, Albert Einstein before. I should quote Warren Buffett right now. Warren Buffett's best quote of all time was when he said, what we learn from history is that people don't learn from history. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the fact that Powell is comparing himself to the superhero, uh, Paul Volcker, who did kill inflation, by the way, through back to back recessions and a three year bear market in equities. So, you know, be careful what you wish for when people say he is the modern day Paul Volcker. Yeah, well, be careful which asset classes you want to be long of if you have that belief. But really, it's more like William McChesney Martin. And but when Chesney Martin made that comment that the Fed, we are taking the punch bowl away. And he said that actually at an investment banker conference. Imagine that. Imagine having the guts to do that uh, back in October of 1955. But he said it's up, it's up to the Fed to be the chaperone to take the punch bowl away as the party is just getting started. That's a direct quote. You see, this time around, the problem, the problem for the investment community is that Powell decided to take this punch bowl away after he played the role of bartender for 18 months and handing out the free drinks right up till 3 a.m. Uh, and so, as they say, uh, the higher they go, the harder they fall. And so we're paying the price. We are gonna pay the price dearly, pay the price dearly for the excess of monetary accommodation that was put in place in 2020, after March, 2020, 2021, you know, there was a period indeed where, the, you know, Powell played the role of the country's social worker. He was the nation's social worker, inclusive on employment rates and keeping rates zero forever. You know, of course, look, we had the pandemic raging. We locked down the economy. It was hitting the lower end of the social and income strata the hardest. And yeah, that's right. But, you know, um, people will say, well, look what he did. Look, look what the Fed did. And now he's basically gone the other way. Well, it's uh, once again, I'll quote somebody else. I'm just going to sit here and quote people all day long. John Maynard Keynes, who said, you know, when the facts change, I change. What do you do, sir? So the facts have changed. <laughs> and so that's where we're at right now. But this will not be, this will not be the first time that as investors or as, as economic participants that we paid the price for the Fed's mistakes. Uh, and that's just the bottom line. And uh, I understand people say, well, you know, uh, but look at the unemployment rate lagging indicator. Look at non-farm payrolls, coincident indicator. I don't care. I drive and I've always driven in this business by focusing and looking through the front window. And we are going to have a recession in 2023 significant recession 2023 and i get comments all the time well rosenberg this has got to be the most telegraphed and advertised recession of all time oh really is that the case because tell it then to the equity analysts on wall street who continue to think that corporate earnings are going to go up next year uh because i'll tell you that's never happened in a recession and so the same people say, yeah, but look at the multiple, the multiples 21 to 16, it's a 16 multiple. No, 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 it's not. If you actually believe that we're going to have a recession, and I, I actually think, I, I always say nothing is zero, nothing is 100, but I'm going to tell you something, okay? Everything I'm looking at in my crystal ball recession is as close to 100% probability for next year. Uh, I've a, never seen in my life anything. I have more conviction over this call than I had when I was pounding my fist on the table on the housing bubble back in the mid 2000s. And usually you get corporate earnings with a very small standard deviation go down 20 to 25% in a recession. So you think, you think I'm buying the market at an average multiple of 16. No, you're not. You're buying it on these artificial estimates the analysts haven't got to yet. They're too busy cutting the fourth quarter. <laughs> You're buying <laughs> it at a multiple that's 21. And I got news for you. They ain't no bargain. 
And I got something else to tell you, again, when you put your history hat on, unless you're willing to say it is going to be different this time, there's not a fundamental low in the market at a 21 multiple, okay? And so that's why next year, I think we're going to have actually two forces colliding, which means that this entire bull market from the March 2020 lows could be wiped out because the multiple contraction phase isn't over, unfortunately. And then we're going to we're going to coincide with an earnings recession. And I get people all the time saying to me, you know, are we at the, are we at the bottom? You get these, we've had how many, we've had eight attempts at the 200 day moving average this year in the S&P. We're still down roughly 20%. Countless bear market rallies and, and, and everybody is so, wants to turn bullish. Who doesn't want to turn bullish? I want to turn bullish, but the, 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 the necessity to turn bullish, it's incredible. It's incredible. I'll tell you, you know, you want to talk about sentiment before. What, what is sentiment? What, the market vein, investors intelligence, the AI, I mean, those are like trading tools. Those are trading. Sentiment is a nice little trading tool to see, are we overdone on the selling? Are we overdone on the buying? Yeah, there's short-term swings in sentiment, sure. But I'll tell you when you get to a low. If we're going to basically say, we have gone through the most aggressive interest rate cycle since the early 80s. And you have a central banker who likes to compare himself to, to, uh, to Paul Volcker. Let's just remember that the if you want to talk about, you know, people say, where's the Powell put? Where's the Powell put? You see, what they're trying to do and take the punch bowl away is they're trying to get people to stop saying, where's the Powell put? They're trying to eliminate the whole concept of the Fed put. But I'll tell you, he wants to compare himself to Paul Volcker, the Paul Volcker put at the lows. The fundamental lows in August 1982 was eight. <laughs> that was, oh, he's Paul Volcker. He's going to kill inflation. You know, he's this is just great. Yeah, just remember, remember where where that low in the multiple was after back to back recessions uh, was uh, an eight multiple on the S and P 500. But more to the point, you want to talk about sentiment. Here's sentiment. And look, I was uh, I was just uh, heading into grad school in economics at the University of Toronto at that point. But you see the benefit of working at Merrill Lynch as long as I did was you get to speak to a lot of the old timers who are around, the thundering herd. And, and you know what they told me? You know what they told me? Like they told me this after I, I joined Merrill back in the late nineties. And uh, they told me that at those lows in the early eighties, and this is where it's all about sentiment, is that if you were, a retail broker at Merrill Lynch in 1981 or 1982, and you cold called a prospect, they'd call the cops on you. Okay. You know that at the lows, at the lows in 1982, at the fundamental lows, did you know that half of the Merrill brokers were driving taxi cabs at night? Okay. So you want to talk about where you get to fundamental lows. It's not when I'm getting asked every day, have we hit bottom yet? Have we hit bottom yet? Have we hit bottom yet? You know, so basically, I have the benefit of having 2,800 clients in 40 countries. So I have my own seven indicators. And I think that if I can go maybe a month and not have somebody ask me, have we hit bottom yet? I'll say, boy, that's a real important contrary signpost. You know, because I will just continue to say what I've been saying, which is that, you know, leave the bottom picking to the proctologists. Uh, they typically do a better job than the rest of us. The uh, one of the we've got a question on the uh, on the chat. Thank you so much, David. Very uh, very colorful and uh, and and uh, and certainly a cogent, if sobering, message uh, for the for the markets going forward. Uh, just from the chats, uh, talking about in in this what what does this mean for the Fed's near term rate path? You know, obviously the the scenario you played out is having them stay at restrictive levels for a long period or an extended period of time to, you know, keep the punch bowl from coming back or, you know, as someone else put it, you know, execute a controlled demolition of asset prices, uh, which, uh, <laughs> but uh, how how high do you think the Fed has to go or is able to go uh, with their rate hike cycle? You mentioned earlier, you thought they were close to the end. Well, they've, uh, look, they, they've already dramatically over tightened. I, I mean, you've got um, the two tens curve, is already uh, like minus 68 basis points. It's back to where it was in 1981. Um, 
we've only seen the Fed tighten policy into a yield curve inversion um, under the Volcker era. I mean, and they're still tightening. Uh, and um, they've already, and we won't know this until next year, the extent to which they have really over tightened uh, in this cycle. And they're clearly not done. Uh, you had, you know, James Bullard, uh, I tweeted today that maybe we should just take the first four letters of James Bullard's last name out. Okay, just take the bull out of his name. And he says that in the terminal rate is anywhere from five to 7%. And I'm going, whoa, daddy. Uh, but you see, he's not going to come out and say, we want the market to go lower. We want the housing market to go lower. We want your equity portfolio to go lower. Uh, by the way, as these things go lower, you're going to go back to work. Uh, that's what they're doing. Um, so they're in, instead, they're instead they're saying crazy things like we're going another, we could go another 250 basis points. I mean, think about that right now. Um, is the economy booming? No. Uh, is the yield curve steep? No. Are we in a bull market in a, a really anything? No. Uh, is the dollar weak? No. Oh, but we're going to keep on raising rates uh, and using inflation as a camouflage. Inflation is a lagging indicator. Inflation typically peaks six months into the recession. And yeah, we had a bout of inflation. We did have inflation and the inflation came from uh, COVID and all the complications that happened with COVID, dramatic supply side effects globally. It was a global pandemic. China closing down, God forbid, and you know, China gets five COVID cases in a 20 million population port city and Beijing shuts it down for months. And that screws up global supply chains. That's inflationary. We have Putin invading the Ukraine. What are you first shooting war in 80 years in Europe? Well, we know wars are inflationary. All these pressures are now subsiding. And then of course we had all the fiscal stimulus, but it was really temporary stimulus checks. It wasn't like an FDR new deal with multi-year multiplier impacts. The, the, you know, the, the, but they can use, because the inflation rate is still so high, it's come down, but it's still so high. You can still say to people, hey, we got 7% inflation, 8% inflation, you know, it's off its peak, but hey, we still got the inflation. We still got to do this. Uh, we, we, you know, um, they talk about the labor market and wages. Wages are slowing down. They're still elevated, but, you know, it's interesting because previously the, the nation's social worker, uh, Jay Powell was talking about inclusive unemployment rates and getting wages up for low-skilled workers. Well, maybe if there's a bright light that came out of the pandemic, it was a realization as to that, you know, we were not actually in a labor market treating these people as well as we should. So they got pay raises. Oh, see the inflation, the inflation, the inflation. So in any event, back to the answering the question, they're barking a lot. Um, uh, I think that, um, I think it's it's situational. So I think that they are clearly waiting for something to break. Let's let's just let, let's 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 peel this. Uh, you know the uh, uh, let, let's get this peel off the uh, off the onion. Okay, one at a time. Is this about the? Are they waiting for the economy to slow down? It's been weak all year. It's going to be a flat year for the economy. Not notwithstanding what's happened with employment. Because the fallout from that is that we've had a year of negative productivity. Okay, flat year for the economy. Uh, you know, uh, is it, what else is going on? I mean, the inflation is in the rearview mirror. And by the way, they know that, although they're going to be very hesitant to say it. Don't you see the? It's so it's so clear, right? Like what happened? So the Fed says in the summer, oh, oh, we are going to become data dependent. The market rips. What was that like a 14% rally? And uh, and then at Jackson Hole, uh, he he backtracks on that, pal. And then you got Neil Kashkari, the former Uber dove, coming on and saying on TV, we were not happy with how the market responded to uh to what we said about data dependency in the summer, but we were, by the way, very happy with the negative response we got after Jackson Hole. Do you do, do not see that? I mean, Neil Kashkari. Uh, I mean, he, he's been the only one to talk directly about the stock market, but he basically said to you, and this was back in September, we want the market down. We want financial conditions to tighten. We are want to take the punch bowl away. And so then you have the situation, which was not a two-month bear market rally that the Fed could assess, uh, but you had the last FOMC meeting uh, in September where they put in there in the press statement that we are respectful to the policy lags, what I talked about earlier on the economy. And then the market says, pivot, 
pause, pivot, and then in a half an hour, the market rips. And the Fed's watching this, right? Because I'm sure they have Bloomberg terminals. And then Powell comes up a half an hour later and says, uh, oh, by the way, our estimate of the terminal rate is actually higher now than it was what we thought it was, uh, you know, back in, the, back in the summer. And then the market sells off dramatically. So you see, I think that they will be done. They will be done tightening. It will not be a data point. You know, we already had back-to-back -back quarters of negative GDP. Then employment rate, nobody talks about it. Went from 3.5 to 3.7. It's still low. But by the way, the unemployment rate is starting to hook up. And they're still talking hawkishly. Because they're not seeing the market respond in a way that they want it to respond. It's so obvious that what they're waiting for is they're waiting for a situation where something really dovish happens. Something incredibly dovish happens. Something that would get a rational person to think, my God, they should pause. They should pivot. And yet the market doesn't respond. They're trying to break that link. They're trying to get, they're basically trying to, uh, to take the bell away from Pavlov's dog. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get the market to stop salivating over what the Fed's going to do. Does it, is it just me or does anybody not think like we're basically like in, 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 in like a, Alice in Wonderland here that basically it's all it's all about what's the Fed going to say or pause pivot. I mean, it's so bloody ridiculous. That's the Fed wants to basically the Fed understands its power on the markets. It understands it's always had that because I said before, what is more important than interest rates? But we have hit a ridiculous multi, uh, you know, what, what more can you call it? It's a, uh, a multiple standard deviation event where we're just all consumed with, with what the next syllable is going to be. They want to they break that link. So I'm going to say that the first time, the first time, you see what's going to happen? We're going to get a negative payroll report, right? And instead of the market thinking, wow, for the first time, we're going to get negative payrolls. The Fed's going to watch how does the market respond? Because if the market rips the negative payrolls because it thinks now the Fed's going to cut interest rates, they're not going to cut interest rates. They're waiting for the day where something happens that is actually legitimately dovish and the market doesn't care. That will be the signpost. signpost. So it's not about a data point. It's not about sentiment. It's not about anything we've already talked about. It's about the psychology that Powell is trying to to break and they made it really clear it couldn't have been clearer than at the last fomc meeting where what he said after watching the market respond to the statement that was you see that was a litmus test so that's what the situation is um, they will go as far as they go and i don't know what the number is will they go to five and a half will they go to six is bullard right that we can go to seven until mr market wakes up and says okay uh, you know, we're going to recession. We're not going to rally this thing just because of what the Fed's going to do. That'll be a very important day. Now, even historically, when we're not dealing with this sort of market insanity, so salivating over what the Fed is going to do, think of the ridiculousness, by the way, to even talk about a pivot. But what is a pivot? They're talking now. Uh, I mean, people get people get bullish because, I mean, you're sitting there, central banker, really? These people like on, on CNBC and on Bloomberg TV and Fox Business and all these newspapers are they're turning bullish because we're going to start to go 50 basis points instead of 75. Like think how crazy that is. Oh, that's you see, that's the definition of today's pivot. Today's pivot is uh, used to be a pivot was your cutting rates. They're not even talking about pausing. Now, here's the deal. When you look historically, even we're not in the sort of very insane investor psychology uh which i think was emblematic with you know kathy wood and and all these meme stocks and rot let's think of all the ridiculousness the robin hood the reddit accounts the new generation the democratization of the market you know look how crazy all that was and then of course crypto which is you know <laughs> you can't make this stuff up but you see that is what the mentality they're trying to break uh, I, I imagine that if we can get a negative non-farm payroll report, and if the market says, uh-oh, a recession is actually here, we're going to get an earnings recession, I got to get the hell out of Dodge, that'll be important. Now, if they say, oh, well, but the Fed's going to start to cut rates, I got to buy the market, that's it. 
That's it. This Fed has told you they don't really care about the economy. They don't. They're taking a really long-term view of trying to break this very destabilizing and healthy link that's impaired productivity and rational thought in this economy for decades. Uh, that is the game plan for Jay Powell's second term. And I'll tell you that when we look into the transcripts five years from now, that's what we're going to be reading. So I don't know how high the funds rate is going to go uh, because we're dealing with something that's important. We will just know that it's situational. We know that they have, they were going into like only one other time in the early 80s. They're racing rates into an inverted yield curve and a recession staring us in the face and they don't give a damn. And I think that it's when we stop talking about the, the pivot and we start talking about the pause, even in these other cycles historically. Um, the Fed, the Fed always pauses. There's always a pause. You know, we talk about the, the we talk about the Powell pivot in 2019. With all due respect, um, they didn't start to cut rates. I think till August, so they paused in January. It does. The rate cuts don't come right away. You remember back in the famous when they started calling, um, you know, uh, Alan Greenspan maestro in 1995 because he achieved the fable soft landing, which usually has a no more than a 20% chance of ever occurring. Uh, the Fed's last rate hike was in February. They didn't start to cut rates till July. So whatever you want to call a pivot, I call a pivot cutting rates. I don't call a pivot, oh, they're going from 75 to 50 to 25. That's still tightening. Pause comes first, then the pivot. But even in normal times, when the market is even, you know, not nearly as, as, as really crazy about focusing on every nuance out of the Fed, as has been the case for the past couple of years. And I would say that maybe the Fed was, you know, caused that to some effect as well, because at any time, Powell could have come out and said, you know, I think FOMO and TINA are very dangerous acronyms, but he never did that. But, you know, whatever, that's, that's in the rearview mirror, and that sort of complaining doesn't help anybody. <laughs> uh, the, rea the reaction function is going to be, so in, in any event, they, they will pause. They'll pause. They, they will pause when the market behaves rationally. Full stop. That's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for a rational market. Do you think they want to have the market rip? We're not even actually. And when you think about it, the long term multiple is 15. We're still at 16 and change. Bill, so so they that's what they want to do. It's it's really it's all about the markets, and they're not going to come out and spoon feed you. You we have to figure that out ourselves by looking at their reaction function. The reaction mm -hmm. function is not about the economy. Uh, you look at all these the commodities, the freight rates, supplier delivery delays, everything that we were belly aching about uh, is in the rearview mirror. People say to me, oh, but the prices of everything are so high. I don't care about that. Neither should you. The prices of everything were still high. In the, all the seven years that Volcker was here at the Fed, prices were high. Inflation is about the, the momentum. Yeah. of prices not about the level okay so, volcker never got oil prices back to three dollars a barrel okay where it was in the early 70s the that's, a, that's a good could, segue the best, into... was get it, the best he could do is get it to 20 um <laughs> you know from 40 okay uh but you'll see well the price of oil is still seven times more than it was pre-opec embargo it's like having your head in the sand yeah the bottom line is that oil went down 50 percent uh from the peak it's about the it's about the rate of change. Everything in our business is at the margin. Oh, so the bottom line here, a long-winded way of saying that uh, the Fed is going to pause. We know that it will pause when it sees what it wants. Um, and I think that it will be slow to cut rates. It will be slow to cut rates. But this whole view that, oh, well, the, they're going to keep rates higher for longer. It's just pure guesswork, pure guesswork. And that's that's all I ever hear. I've heard that for cycles. I heard that coming out of the early 90s. We'll never see 3% of the funds rate again. Oh, really? Because I seem to remember that uh, in the next cycle, you know, we got to 1%. Oh, well, we'll never see 1% again, which is where we got to after the tech wreck. No, of course not. We got in the next cycle to zero with quantitative easing. And well, we'll never see zero again. No, we'll see zero again in the next recession, pandemic or not pandemic, uh, with zero and with a balance sheet that's twice as big as it was the previous cycle. And I hear all the time, well, they'll never cut rates. Rates are going to stay high because we have structural inflation. I will bet all day long against that view. Because when they start to cut rates, when they start to cut rates, it's when all the bad stuff that's already happened, 
all the bad stuff from the, what the Fed's done feeds through. We're already starting to see cracks in house prices. That's a really big deal. Not everybody owns stocks. I think everybody on the show owns stocks. Most people, two thirds of them own houses. And we could talk about, well, the banks are so much better capitalized and the household balance sheet. It's the, it's, it's the effect on psychology and your spending patterns when your principal asset deflates. You don't have to use 2006, seven, eight as your benchmark. Uh, whenever you've had home price deflation in the past, and, and we don't have to use the financial crisis, we're gonna put that aside. It's never a good thing when asset prices deflate. And then it creates all sorts of other problems. You get a default cycle. The banks end up tight their, tighten their credit scoring. This is not 06, 07, 08. I know that. I lived through that. I was on the front lines at Merrill. I know that I'm not drawing comparisons. Everybody says to me all the time, well, it's not going to be 06, 07, 08. Okay, well, why would you want to fight the last war? What I'm trying to say is that we are heading into, in the next year, into a deflationary environment. And the Fed will be cutting rates. And bond yields will be coming down because guess what? Interest rates are cyclical. So I actually think that uh, they will be cutting rates very, very hard. I'm sensing in the second half of next year because I think a lot of the bad stuff that I'm talking about that actually will break the back of this truly insane market mentality of, uh, of front running the Fed and jumping into the market because they're going to pause or pivot. You know, once that ends, and that's what we have to look for, They'll be cutting rates because of the economy and because of deflation, because of deflation. And people look at me like I am absolutely moronic and that I should be carried out in a gurney to the nearest psychiatric ward. My friends, I was saying the same thing in the summer of 08 when oil was $150 a barrel and everybody thought it was a soft landing. Don't you remember? Everybody thought that Beer Stearns was that. that everybody thought that Beer Stearns in March of uh, 2008, that that was it. That was the crisis. It was done. And Lehman Brothers, with the help of the Fed, cleaned it up. That's what everybody thought. Do you know in the summer of 08, the Fed switched to a tightening bias? Did you know that? Did you know two months before Lehman, AIG, Merrill collapsed, the Fed, Bernanke switched to a tightening bias, and Triche, the brilliant man that he is, raised rates in Europe two months before Lehman collapsed. And I was saying, and I was at Merrill at the time, and all the bright lights on the, on the global economics team, uh, oh, oh, the Chinese commodity super cycle and uh, global decoupling and like fairy tales that you just build up. And I can't tell you the debates I had internally and with clients about inflation. Now inflation wasn't seven, eight, nine percent but then again, we didn't have COVID and we didn't have a war, uh, but we had the Chinese commodity super cycle. And if you remember oil almost got to $150 a barrel in the summer of 2008. And I was just talking about deflation and frankly, I thought, uh, I think my job's on the line. A year later, the year over year CPI is negative two. Year later, negative two. And all I hear is people talking about inflation. Inflation is a lagging indicator. Inflation usually continues to rise and peak six months into the recession. And that's all people want to talk about. And they want to fight yesterday's war. Yesterday's war. I'm going to fight tomorrow's war. Tomorrow's war is going to be, we are reverting back to deflation. And that's why my biggest trade is the long bond, uh, which, by the way, has rallied a lot uh, just over the course of the past month. And I don't think that's a flash in the pan. There are questions on the uh, on the chat about oil and gas. So judging from your uh, your deflationary outlook, you don't think uh, that oil prices are going to hold up uh, even in the face of the supply constraints and uh, weaponizing energy from Russia. You're, you're bearish on energy uh, on the basis of that. Well, let me clarify this. Uh, you've already seen, I mean, oil got to 120, you know, at the peak. So uh, commodities in general are, are cyclical, um, but what you're gonna find coming out of the cycle is that they're gonna, they're gonna bottom at higher levels than they have in previous recessions. So I think you wanna separate the cyclical vagaries of what impacts commodities to what are truly very positive secular supply side forces at play. A lack of capital investment um, for years, if not decades, in many aspects. 
there will be tremendous pressures, uh, especially in the green commodity part of the situation. Um, I, I am a believer that long term, I don't know what the long term is for fossil fuels. We certainly know that on the near term, uh, I'm going to limit my bearishness on the fact that, um, you know, normally in a recession, you would have had oil prices. You know, where did oil prices go? You know, coming out of the great super cycle, we got down to what, like $30 a barrel. Hasn't happened this time. So I think the, the good news for commodities is that uh, once we flush all this out next year, they might be the first asset class you want to go back into uh, ahead of treasuries. Treasuries are, I think, um, looking very attractive. Uh, and um, and I think the curve inversion, I mean, that's the thing. Treasuries rally in recessions. Uh, and uh, whether we're talking about whether the Fed goes to five or five and a half, um, we're close to the end of this tightening cycle, no matter what. And then the recession comes, the Fed cuts, the curve steepens, you'll get the biggest bang for the buck total return wise from the long bond. And, uh, but I'd say that for commodities, this back to the question in oil, uh, I am, I'm long term, I'm, I'm actually long term bullish. I'm actually long term bullish. So uh, near term, not so much. Uh, but, um, uh, but I think that the commodity complex in general, I wouldn't be just be focused on on oil. Okay, I think that you'd want to have some broad diversification. Uh, in the commodity space, uh, because uh, the supply backdrop will be constructive for many, many years. And th that should be part of anybody's portfolio, in my opinion. And so a question from getting out of the near term cyclical pressures I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and the last question from the chat that we have right now, and please, uh, we, we do have a little more time left. So if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Last question on gold and gold stocks. Speaking of diversification of a, of a commodity portfolio, this is, uh, you know, the 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 kind of interplay between uh, the Fed and uh, and fundamentals uh, creates a pretty muddled picture for gold. Uh, do you have a do you have a a roadmap? Do you think that it follows? Well, I, 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 I firstly, I am very I am very bullish on gold and the gold mining stocks. Uh, I've been I've been actually actively buying uh, Canadian uh, gold coins that I've been having stored at the uh, at the Royal Canadian Mint. Um, Maybe you can claim that as my, uh, I'm not, it's not my end of the world scenario. It's just that uh, I'd rather have gold coins than gold bars because who knows how things in this crazy world are going to end up. But I, I, that, that's been my last trade has been, has been buying gold coins and I've been very active. You mean for portability? Regard. Pardon me? You mean for portability? Having that's for portability, bars. you know, because, uh, you know, when, when you're this bearish and when you're this bearish and you're a notorious uh, economist, you, you have to basically, uh, <laughs> I might be on the run. You never know. Um, but no, I, I, I am bullish on gold. I'll tell you why. Uh, firstly, is that I think the Fed's going to cut rates in the second half of next year. I, I think that there is, it's just, it's just natural. I know people out there think they'll never cut rates. I hear that all the time near the peak of the tightening cycle because they don't want to give you the indication they're ever going to do that, but they will do that. Interest rates are cyclical. Uh, real rates and uh, gold prices have a time-worn inverse correlation. I think real rates are going to come down. Uh, and I think at the same time, uh, the most overcrowded trade is probably the long trade on the intercontinental exchange on the U.S. dollar. The trade-weighted U.S. dollar is, I mean, if you look at the net spec of long position in the DXY, it looks like a dot-com stock from 1999. There's been good reasons to be bullish on the U.S. dollar. Of course, the famous refrain about, you know, the U.S. is the cleanest shirt in the laundry basket, although that shirt has a lot of stains on it. Um, but I think that you're going to find that um, the Fed is going to go on hold. Other central banks that have lagged behind will play a little bit of catch up. Uh, and you're going to find that uh, these naked long positions are going to take their profits. And then the U.S. dollar is not going to crash, but it's going to go down. And of course, gold's price in U.S. dollars. You see, I get this all the time. What's wrong with gold? What's wrong with gold? What's wrong with gold? What's wrong with gold? Nothing is wrong with gold. Gold has actually done, look at gold in sterling terms, euro terms, yen terms. Yeah. Yep. It's a U.S. dollar story. Everything, you, you know, so I, I don't know. Do, do we want to talk about what, what the price of gold looks like, you know, in the, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of anything else, it's priced in dollars. U.S. dollars been in a bull market. Real rates have gone up uh, and gold's been in the penalty box. But I think that uh, things are going to be changing in, in gold's favor. Uh, and I think that probably is already starting. Um, the other part is this uh, is the realization 
uh, that Bitcoin was a bit of the Pied Piper, uh, the digital gold. Um, you know, look, whenever I ask people with the Bitcoin, and I admit I, I'm no expert, uh, you know, I, I just find that the only, only three people were buying Bitcoin, okay? Uh, the three people were like, uh, you know, the Paul Tudor Joneses, that would be, could be a big buyer and it would still be a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of his portfolio. Or there'd be these people that think, oh my God, this is going to be my get rich, get, get rich quick scheme, Bitcoin. So you had these people that loaded up on Bitcoin, like they loaded up on cannabis stocks or, or like how they loaded up on meme stocks to get rich quick. And then you had these wealthy billionaires that, okay, I'll take a punt. It's not, you know, what, am I going to notice it? And then the third, of course, are the oligarchs. <clears throat> so what we found now with this, uh, uh, with the fact that um, Bitcoin is inherently unstable, <clears throat> is not a store of wealth by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it might be fun to trade if you have ice in your veins. But you see, we did the work on the past few years because the flows out of uh, gold back ETFs and into Bitcoin, and our estimation cost um, gold in terms of price between 10 and 20%. Uh, just because there's a new kid on the block that was just a lot sexy, a lot sexier called uh, crypto. And I think that's going to come out, okay? Uh, because of gold's more natural, uh, stable features in what is going to be uh, a, a, um, uh, a world where uh, safety is going to be a lot more important than what it's been. Um, and we're moving away from the Gordon Gecko world. Uh, and that's going to hurt speculative assets uh, like crypto, you know, when I always ask people about crypto, by the way, they always said, well, we don't Bitcoin, there's a production ceiling. I said, okay. Um, and we value it against the outstanding valuation of gold. So I say, well, why don't you just buy gold then? Um, and so I would admit that there's maybe less optionality in gold because it's more stable and that, uh, and you can trade Bitcoin. This is probably crypto is probably just fun to trade as an investment, or God forbid, as somebody's asset mix. Uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, but I think that gold is going to do very well now that crypto, in general, uh, has been exposed as something that you cannot rely on uh, in a uh, in troubled times. Look at how gold has hung in so well the past few months, and look what crypto was done. So I think that's going to be a reminder. So I expect that a lot of the flows will go back into gold. I think that again, but the most important thing are the fundamentals, the two most important driving forces for gold. The gold mining stocks have greater optionality than gold, understood. They're still part of the stock market, mind you, uh, is declining real rates, next year story, declining US dollar, next year story. And that is a bullish backdrop for bullion. Well, we've taken awesome. you to the top of the hour. Thank you so yeah. much. I, we 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 really appreciate your time and insights. And uh, the yeah, the road ahead is a, is a challenging one for market participants. But uh, you've given us a uh, great great uh, insights and, and preparation for this. So, well, thanks for giving me the opportunity not just to come on, but also to finish off on on something positive. <laughs> <laughs> something to <heal> up. <laughs> Excellent. David, so thank David. you. Thank, thank you. you thank much. you again. Gentlemen, my, my pleasure. All the best to you. You too.